All right, so today we're going to get into the neurologic examination. Um, and let's finish up here talking in a little bit about CSF and meninges. So I mentioned there are three different types of hydrocephalus. Um, two of them are a true hydrocephalus. The other is kind of a, uh, you'll see, it's kind of a pseudo, not truly a hydrocephalus. So uh, we finished off talking about here, maybe we've got a mass. And actually someone asked if I could use a cursor because then it would would record, so I'm going to try that today. Um, but anyway, so we've got a mass here. Let's just say this is compressing the third ventricle, cerebral aqueduct. So the, the lateral ventricles are going to just dilate. Okay, so this is a non-communicating hydrocephalus. And very important um, here, oftentimes a patient comes into the emergency room with something like this, and uh, maybe a lumbar puncture, you know, you're thinking could be something that would be helpful. We want to analyze the cerebral spinal fluid. Um, you can never do a lumbar puncture in this kind of a setting when there's a non-communicating hydrocephalus. And the reason is you're drawing out fluid in the lumbar cistern, but yet the area above the blockage is under increased pressure, right? Those lateral ventricles are under increased pressure. So you're creating a pressure gradient Okay, and the brain can actually herniate and the patient can die. All right, so when you do a lumbar puncture, uh, and there would be some exceptions, but in most cases we'd prefer to have a brain scan first to look and see that we're not dealing with um, something like this. Okay, so avoid a lumbar puncture in a non-communicating hydrocephalus. Now a uh, communicating hydrocephalus would be where the ventricles communicate. There's no blockage between the lateral, third, and fourth ventricle. And the problem is usually out here in the arachnoid granulations. Okay, so the two conditions we've talked about out here in the subarachnoid space are meningitis and subarachnoid hemorrhage. And either of those, an infection or bleeding, can cause scarring of these arachnoid granulations. And so CSF can't get out into the superior sagittal sinus here as well, so that the pressure kind of backs up everywhere, okay, both into the subarachnoid space and into the lateral ventricles. All right, so that's a communicating hydrocephalus. And in that case, um, you, you are not creating such a dramatic pressure gradient, uh, again, because that pressure is going to be increased in both subarachnoid space and ventricular system. And so you can do a lumbar puncture um, in that situation. So again, we do not do it in a non-communicating hydrocephalus. All right, so if you get a scan like this and we're just looking at one image and we see the lateral ventricles are really large, you can't tell from this whether it's a communicating or non-communicating hydrocephalus. Okay, you would need all of the sections of the brain to make sure, you know, is there a mass or a structural lesion um, that accounts for this. Okay, so what you have in your handout here are three examples. Let's say the one here on the left is just a normal lateral ventricle size. Um, here we have large lateral ventricles. All right, so this is hydrocephalus. This could be communicating. It could be non-communicating. And our third example is over here, and this is called hydrocephalus ex vacuo. Now notice the ventricles are the same size um, in this example. A cartoon example of, as the hydrocephalus. The difference is, notice all the black out here around the surface of the brain. Um, this indicates atrophy or shrinkage of the brain. All right, so this is a patient that has something like Alzheimer's disease, and we'll go through a bunch of different dementia syndromes. Um, and so the, the whole brain shrinks. And as the brain shrinks, um, well, guess what? That includes the all of the tissue and the pathways around the lateral ventricles. So the lateral ventricles appear large, but it's not really a hydrocephalus. They just have a large appearance because of atrophy. So we call that hydrocephalus ex vacuo. And usually the key is that when you look around the surface of the brain, you see lots of atrophy there as well. Okay, so this is not a neurologic emergency. And so you just want to be aware of that when we're looking at brain scans that we not overdiagnose some, you know, 90 in, in your, your in the old, old individual has Alzheimer's disease and think that we need to be operating um, on them. All right, so in an autopsy, this is what hydrocephalus ex vacuo looks like. Big ventricles, 
But these are not under increased pressure because look at all of the atrophy here. Uh, this is the sylvian fissure. Um, this is the third ventricle. This is the temporal horn of the lateral ventricle. And just the brain is much smaller from um, atrophy. All right, the, the brain has a very important barrier called the blood-brain barrier that seals off the brain from toxic substances. And there are three layers to this. The most important um, are the endothelial cells, which have tight junctions. Okay, they're right here in the cartoon. So this is any old capillary. It tends to be rather leaky. Okay, so we put the lock here to show you that these tight junctions with endothelial cells are most important. But there is also a basement membrane, and there are these astrocyte foot processes around the blood vessels which um, contribute as well. Uh, this will become really important when next year when we talk about neuropharmacology and we discuss which medications cross the blood-brain barrier, which medications do not cross the blood-brain barrier. But there are some areas of the brain that lack a blood-brain barrier. Okay, you can see, for example, the pineal gland uh, lacks a blood-brain barrier. Uh, but there's really just one that is important that you know about, and that is down here. Um, so here's the fourth ventricle. All right, so kind of at the lower part of the fourth ventricle, there's an area called the area postrema, also known as the vomiting center. Okay, so when you, because this lacks a blood-brain barrier, um, if you ingest something that is toxic or certain medications, like, uh, for example, chemotherapeutic medications tend to cause a lot of nausea and vomiting. Well, they do that through stimulation of the area postrema. It doesn't have blood-brain barrier, so you take those medications and patients um, you know, will feel sick and, and will throw up. Okay, so all of the areas of the brain that lack a blood-brain barrier are called circumventricular organs. So for now, just know the area postrema. All right, let's just make a big distinction. You have, I think, two, maybe even three hours in the second year on meningitis and encephalitis. But for now, I just want you to know the difference between those terms. Okay, meningitis, uh, as you may know, patients, it's an infection that involves the meninges. So the inflammation there, remember the nerve fibers are in the dura. And so when there's a lot of inflammation there, it's extremely painful. So meningitis, a headache is a major feature. It's an infection, so patients have a fever. And there's a lot of neck stiffness, um, especially like if you ask a patient to bend their chin down to their chest because doing that stretches the meninges. And so patients will tell you that's excruciating just to bend their chin to the chest. So a lot of neck stiffness. And most of the three major categories of meningitis are either bacterial, viral, or fungal. Um, I did list on the handout the most common bacterial meningitis by age, newborn, children, and adults. Um, I won't ask you that because you, you, you get it hit so hard in the second year, but it's such a common board question. I just kind of put it here, and if you want to start learning now, you can, but I won't ask you about organisms. Okay, what's the difference between meningitis and encephalitis? Encephalitis, actually, we have inflammation of the brain itself. It's not just an infection of the coverings of the brain. So the presentation can be quite similar. Both patients have headache and fever, but because now we have distinct areas of the brain that are involved with inflammation, the patient's going to have some focal problems, generally. So if the encephalitis um, irritates the cortex of the brain, frequently patients will have seizures. Um, oftentimes these are more confused, even comatose patients. If the inflammation involves the language areas, the patient may have an aphasia. If it involves the motor cortex, they may have weakness. So you don't need to memorize this, but it's essentially uh, brain symptoms of focal weakness, aphasia, anything like that would suggest that the patient has an encephalitis um, rather than a meningitis. And, and we'll see that distinction is important. So I'll just tell you about one encephalitis, probably the most important one for you to know about because it's treatable. So we want to just be really in tune for this. And this is called herpes simplex encephalitis. Right? So again, a meningitis or encephalitis, you get headache or fever. This tends to involve the temporal lobes. And remember I told you that the uncus is the most epileptic part of the brain. 
And so frequently these patients will have seizures along with it. Okay, remember we have important limbic um, structures like the parahippocampal gyrus um, in the temporal lobe, and so oftentimes there are personality changes uh, with this. Patients are confused, and the temporal lobe, remember, contains the most important uh, part of Wernicke's area. And so oftentimes these patients will have a, a language problem, an aphasia. Right? So that's kind of the presentation. This tends to come on rather abruptly and usually over hours or a day or so the patient is in the emergency room. Obviously something is going on. All right, so when we see a patient like this, um, the, the two tests that are most helpful, uh, usually we're going to image the patient first. And so we see swelling in the temporal lobes and kind of a distinctive feature of herpes simplex encephalitis, it's usually both temporal lobes that we see this swelling or edema. Uh, that's a characteristic feature. Okay, And then we can do a lumbar puncture to identify, yep, it's herpes simplex, uh, confirm the diagnosis. And we'll tell you more about what we see on the spinal fluid uh, next year. The reason this is important is if you just don't diagnose this, the mortality is fairly high. Um, but if you diagnose it and get the patient on the appropriate antibiotics, these patients can do quite well. So oftentimes, if we're just entertaining the possibility of herpes simplex encephalitis, we'll just put the patient on antibiotics for it right away um, and then wait till, till we can confirm the diagnosis. All right, so here is an MRI of a patient with herpes simplex encephalitis. We don't really need the arrow here, do we? But uh, we have a lot of inflammation of this temporal lobe and a little bit starting over here as well. Okay, so it's usually the bilateral temporal lobe that is most distinctive. Okay, so uh, when you do a lumbar puncture and you analyze cerebral spinal fluid and you're trying to figure out, okay, is this meningitis or encephalitis, um, we look at several things. Um, and th this comes back within minutes, you get this information. So we see the inflammatory cells, the white blood cells, red blood cells. Glucose is extremely important. Remember, glucose in cerebral spinal fluid is two-thirds that of serum. So we need to monitor the serum glucose. If a patient has diabetes, you need to know what their serum glucose is to get a good comparison. And protein. All right, now some things are more helpful than others. Notice that protein is elevated in just about anything that goes wrong. All right, so don't spend a lot of time, uh, you know, is it two, uh, two up or one up, all right? No, protein is rather nonspecific. Okay, notice that red blood cells tend to be elevated in just about everything here, but especially in a bacterial meningitis, it will be extremely elevated, so that might be helpful. And actually, what is... Most helpful uh, quickly is knowing what the glucose is. And so, usually, when you've got that patient in the emergency room with a headache and fever, you're trying to sort out between a bacterial, viral, or fungal meningitis. Uh, most types, most viral meningitis um, is self limited. The patient gets better after a few days, good prognosis, they don't need antibiotics. And so, notice that with a viral meningitis, we have a normal glucose. So we're reassured as we're getting the initial results back that the glucose is in a normal range, then this is probably viral meningitis, the patient's going to do well. If, so here I would say on the whole table, these would be the most important things here. Very low glucose with a bacterial and a fungal meningitis. Okay, that should just jump out at you because if you're dealing with a bacterial or fungal meningitis, well, there are antibiotics to treat all the specific types of bacteria or fungal uh, meningitis, so we need to get the patient on the appropriate antibiotic as soon as possible. So the low glucose will prompt um, all kinds of alarms to go off and we need to find what, what organism it is that's doing it. Um, now if we have uh, bleeding, so for example a subarachnoid hemorrhage, remember that's an aneurysm, and then the blood rupture, when the aneurysm ruptures, the blood goes into the subarachnoid space, and so now we're going to find lots and lots of red blood cells in the cerebral spinal fluid. Okay, the only reason we have increased white blood cells in a subarachnoid hemorrhage is, remember, red blood cells and white blood cells do not belong in cerebral spinal fluid. And so if you just have blood jetting into the subarachnoid space, 
Well, you've got white blood cells and red blood cells in the blood, right? So you're just seeing blood uh, really here in this space where it doesn't belong. Um, herpes simplex, usually we get inflammatory cells. Herpes simplex tends to be destructive to blood vessels with all that inflammation. So you get some leakage of red blood cells uh, into the cerebral spinal fluid. Um, usually the glucose is normal in herpes simplex, but I put, you know, occasionally there have been some cases where the glucose is low. But please mainly associate low glucose with bacterial or a fungal meningitis. All right, so the last thing here we'll mention, and actually this was asked last time, this happens all the time. You're doing a lumbar puncture and, you know, maybe the, the patient is overweight and it makes it more difficult. Maybe they've had back surgery and so you're in with a needle trying to get into the lumbar cistern and you nick some blood vessels. And so when you analyze the cerebral spinal fluid then, you see red blood cells in the CSF, and you're wondering, okay, is this a subarachnoid hemorrhage, or did I just nick blood vessels doing the lumbar puncture? So this is called a traumatic tap, and we do a couple of things to try to sort this out. So again, we're trying to distinguish, is it subarachnoid hemorrhage or traumatic tap? So one thing we do is we ask the lab to spin down the cerebral spinal fluid and to analyze for something called xanthochromia. Okay, xanthochromia is something that happens if we have red, red blood cells that have been sitting for quite a while in the CSF. And what happens is they lyse, they rupture. And then when you spin down the cerebral spinal fluid, you can see the bilirubin that is released because of the ruptured red blood cells. This takes quite a bit of time to develop. All right, so the patient was at home, they had a subarachnoid hemorrhage, they come into the emergency room. You know, it takes a little while. You see a doctor, you get a brain scan, then finally get a lumbar puncture. So that period of time, the red blood cells are going to lyse, and you're going to have positive xanthochromia. Okay, if you do a traumatic tap, uh, when cerebral spinal fluid is sent down to the lab, it's one of those you know, top priority things. They put it first on the to-do list. They immediately check it. And so if it's a traumatic tap, you're not going to see xanthochromia. So that's one distinguishing feature. The other is when we do a lumbar puncture, uh, we usually have four tubes, and the fluid is slowly dripping out. We'll collect one tube, and a second, third, and a fourth. And so we'll ask the lab to analyze the number of red blood cells maybe in the first tube and the third tube, or the first tube and the fourth tube, something like that. If it's a traumatic tap, the number of red blood cells will be a lot in the first tube, and then less in the second, less in the third. All right. If it's a subarachnoid hemorrhage, well, you've just got a lot of blood in the subarachnoid space, and the red blood cells are going to be consistent in all of the tubes. Okay, so let's get on here to the neurologic examination. And I enjoy talking about this because, um, honestly, what we've been doing so far, I mean, it's, it's nice to be able to uh, name and identify things, but this is where we begin to kind of make it more clinical. The neurologic examination is where we get all of the anatomy we've been talking about to talk to us. All right, so here are the different parts of the neurologic examination. We'll go through in the next four hours um, each of these areas. So we start with mental status, speech and language, cranial nerves, just because this is often a difficult part of neuroanatomy to understand. We'll spend quite a bit of time on cranial nerves. Then we have the motor exam, we check reflexes, sensory exam, cerebellar testing, and gait. Okay, and so every new patient that I see, I do the whole thing. All right, so and when you're in the third year clerkship, um, our OSCE exam, each one of you will go through this complete um, examination. All right, so um, let me just first say something about um, this is not really, I think Dr. Shankel tells you how to take a good history, but I will just say if we're prioritizing here the history, the neurologic examination, and neuroimaging, um, I would say history is almost always the most important thing for me in terms of making a diagnosis. Usually if I don't know what's going on after taking a history, um, well, that's a problem. It's not very often that the exam sudden, suddenly brings something out. That occasionally happens. Um, and so really being able to take a good history in neurology is important. And 
We don't want to just say, okay, neuro, I don't understand anything about neuro, let's just get a brain scan, okay? And so here's just an example. This is about 15 years ago um, where a patient came into an emergency room where I was working, and they had a scan that kind of looked like this, okay? But the patient um, came in with sudden onset left-sided weakness. That was a complaint. An older lady, left-sided weakness. And so she had this CAT scan. When you're looking at CAT scan, you want to think, imagine the patient lying on their back with their feet coming out toward you. All right, so this is on the left side. And so this is quite impressive. And the patient, um, neurosurgery was contacted, and the patient was in the emergency room with, or in the operating room within a short time. This was removed. And the left side of weakness was not uh, getting better. So neurology was consulted. Now, do you see any problem in what I told you so far? Yeah, this is on the left side. Remember that cortical spinal tract we talked about crosses. All right, so if this were going to cause symptoms in terms of weakness, it would be the right side that would be weak. The other thing is this just looks like something that has been there forever. Um, this doesn't look like an acute um, kind of a thing. This patient had sudden onset weakness on one side of the body. Um, so she had a stroke, big stroke in the right hemisphere, and oftentimes on a CAT scan, it takes a while to pick that up. All right, so had an unnecessary surgery. This is something called a meningioma, which is a benign tumor of meninges. Um, and she'd had this for decades and had absolutely nothing to do with, you know, her presentation. So the point here is don't just, boy, we're going to get a scan. We're going to get the answer. Um, you know, this did not fit, you know, operating was not consistent with her history um, or with her examination. All right, so when we're thinking neurologically, the first thing when we see a patient, we want to first ask the question, where is the lesion? And this is really important. And so, uh, and actually our last lecture in December of the second year neuroscience course will be just on this one topic. By then, hopefully, you've put all this together. So this takes quite a bit of work to understand how this works, but um, when we think of the neuroaxis, we start with the cortex. Then subcortical structures, so the white matter, the basal ganglia are there. Uh, then we get down to the brain stem and cerebellum, spinal cord, some cells, the motor neurons in the spinal cord we call anterior horn cells. We'll talk about those um, in the next test cycle. And then we have nerve roots, plexus, peripheral nerve, the neuromuscular junction, and muscle. Okay, so we need to localize where is the lesion. And if you look at this list, uh, let's just use weakness as an example. A patient that comes in with weakness, the lesion could be co cortical, subcortical, brain stem, spinal cord, anterior horn cell, nerve root, plexus, peripheral nerve, neuromuscular junction, or muscle. All right, so weakness can occur with a lesion in any of these locations. So why do we need to localize the lesion first? Well, if we think the lesion's in the brain causing weakness, then we need to do a brain scan, right? But you need to figure that out first. If you've got a muscle disease or a neuromuscular junction disease like myasthenia gravis, uh, well, this can actually mimic brain syndromes, but, you know, a brain scan is not going to be helpful for these patients, right? So we need to first localize where the problem is, and that's the first step in um, figuring out what to do next. So we first localize, and then our next question is, what's the cause? So if we say it's cortical, all right, what is the, the etiology or the cause of the cortical finding? And so just to give you s a few clues to get you going on this, in general, when something comes on suddenly, the patient was normal, and then all of a sudden they have a dramatic neurologic deficit, those are usually cerebrovascular uh, pathology, like a stroke or a hemorrhage. Those come on abruptly. Okay, slowly progressive lesions, like the patient is getting weaker on the right side for four months, and it just keeps getting worse and worse. Well, that's not going to be uh, like a stroke, cerebrovascular. It sounds more like a tumor or some mass that is getting larger. Some things in neurology we'll talk about, it comes and goes. Okay, the patient had blindness in one eye, and then it got better. And then they had numbness on their face, and then it got better. And so there are a number of conditions that present like that in neurology. Multiple sclerosis would kind of be our classic example of that, where things come and go. And then we have conditions that seem to affect the whole brain, 
And every few months, the patient is just getting worse, and they're having more problems, and they're just global, diffuse. So our neurodegenerative conditions um, fit in this category. Alzheimer's would be kind of our classic example of that. Alzheimer's is not just memory loss. Okay, the whole brain is affected. A lot of different function um, is involved there. All right, so we localize, and then we try to speculate a little on the etiology. Okay, so I just have to come back and say one more thing about the history. Um, the neurologic history, we want to attain a very accurate, chronological, detailed description. So when were you last normal? Okay, how did it start? What happened? How did it progress? All of those details um, are just add a lot. Um, I just saw a patient at the VA within the last few months, um, a lady who came in said she had seizures. And um, she was on seizure medications. They weren't helping. And so spent a long time trying to get the story of the events. And it turned out that her seizures mainly occurred when the in-laws came over, <laughs> okay? Which was a little bit of a red flag. And uh, eventually it seemed you know, pretty clear that what she was having are called pseudo-seizures, which is more of a psychological um, kind of a process, not really epileptic seizures in the brain, okay? But it was the history that, you know, allowed to make that diagnosis. So, as I told you, this is the most, the history is the single most important contributor to making the correct diagnosis. So here is a real interaction, and I just thought I would write it down to illustrate this. So there's a patient I saw who said, well, I've been feeling dizzy recently. All right, tell me what happens. Patient, well, I just get dizzy once in a while, that's all. It's hard to explain. One doctor told me it was probably a virus. I saw Dr. X who ordered a brain scan, and then he sent me to an ear, nose, and throat doctor who did some other studies, and he thought that. Well, we're not really getting the history now, are we? We're just, you know, patient went here and there. This is what this doctor thought and so on. I'm interested what the other doctors thought. That's often really helpful. But I want to first hear from the patient. Now, just describe what actually happened. So, you know, finally interjected. Well, just tell me about the first time you noticed the dizziness. Make it a little more specific. Oh, it's been going on for quite a while. I figured it was probably the flu at first. Okay, don't give up here. We haven't learned anything yet, but we need to keep <laughs> probing. Well, tell me about the first time. Well, I was at home. I just felt dizzy. I wish I could describe it better. What were you doing at the time? I was just rolling over in bed. Oh, now that, you will learn, is a really important clue to diagnose this condition. Okay, so use another word besides dizzy to describe what you felt at that moment. Um, dizziness is one of the most vague, nonspecific words. For patients, that can mean weakness, it can mean blurred vision, it can mean lightheadedness. So, um, what do you mean by dizzy? Well, I felt like I was on a boat and the whole room seemed to be moving around. I also felt nauseated and threw up. It was awful. That's about it. Then I went to see my doctor and you know, we're back here again. Okay, but notice the, the feeling here of being like on a boat, a sensation of movement. Um, that's vertigo, okay? So now we're in a smaller category of things that would cause vertigo. All right, well, first tell me what happened next at home that day. And so the patient, that seasick feeling lasted about 10 seconds. I thought I was going to die. Then it was over, and I felt okay until it happened later in the afternoon. Okay, well, have you noticed that rolling over in bed often brings on these spells? Yeah, and it's funny that you ask, but it seems to often happen when I roll over or turn my head to the right. That will bring it on almost every time. Not that that means anything. And of course, <laughs> that means everything, right? This is, um, this is a condition we'll talk about. It's ki called benign positional vertigo. Okay, and it's an inner ear problem. When patients move their head in a certain position and often roll over in bed, it triggers these brief episodes of vertigo. And you could do all the sophisticated testing in the world and you would not make a diagnosis here. Brain scan is not helpful. So we need the history. And then there's one thing we can do on the neurologic examination to uh, support the diagnosis. Okay, so enough preaching here on the history. Let's, let's go through starting with the mental status exam. Okay, don't memorize this. There are several different mental status exams. Um, we're using now an exam called the MOCA exam because it's not copyrighted, unlike another mental status exam. Someone went and copyrighted it. So um, I'm just giving you an example of some questions you can ask. All right, so uh, you will not need to memorize this. So we ask orientation questions. Person, place, time, situation. So um, what's your name? 
Okay, do you know where you are? What's the date today? Why are you here? Okay, so we ask orientation questions. Um, we'll have a patient remember things, either three or four objects. So I often will do these four, Boston, Mr. Johnson, red car, and tunnel. And I'll ask the patient to repeat those back, and then I'll tell them, I'm going to ask you again to remember those in a few minutes. Okay, so we checked more uh, immediate and then remote memory. Okay, you'll need to use the same objects every time, or you will forget and get confused yourself about which ones you know you're doing. So, then attention to test attention. We could do something like give the patient uh, seven numbers and ask them to repeat back as many as possible. Um, we'll give the patient some math problems. Okay, and we'll talk about the area of the brain that might be involved if the patient has difficulty with that. Okay, same thing with construction. We'll have a patient maybe draw a cube or draw, let's say, I like to have a patient draw a clock with the big hand and the little hand to show a time, like 11.20. We'll ask questions uh, like abstraction, maybe proverbs. How are an apple and a banana alike? And sometimes I'm just surprised at the answers you'll get to a question like that. Uh, when you're in the neurology clinic, you will sometimes hear neurologists ask kind of weird things, like, do helicopters eat their young? And, you know, a, a normal patient would laugh, just like you did. Oh, that's a funny question. Um, but, you know, uh, just used Alzheimer's in as an example. Someone with Alzheimer's might say, well, I suppose under an extreme circumstance, they might, you know. <laughs> so... That's helpful information for you. We can ask the patient for information. I like, you know, if they watch the news, what's going on in the world. Um, honestly, I've stopped asking this question because patients tend to get agitated. Uh, who is president? <laughs> but, you know, at least some general questions about what's going on in the world. How many weeks are there in a year? Um, can you define an island? What is an island? Questions like that. All right, now something quick you can do. Um, now, if you're in the em an emergency room encounter, you want to get information quickly. So oftentimes, we'll just try to you know, say, well, we can do the more detailed mental status testing when the patient's admitted. And so we'll often do this in the emergency room, which is called three-step commands. Okay? And so a one-step command would just be close your eyes. Okay? You'd have to be quite impaired cognitively if you can't follow that one-step command. Two-step command... Close your eyes and point to the ceiling. And then a two-step command is touch both shoulders two times with two fingers. Okay, and you will appear as quite a savvy medical student if you're in the third year. Maybe you get to see a patient on your own in the emergency room and you call the resident and say, well, the patient's following three-step commands. Because to a neurologist, that means a lot. You know, you, things are working fairly well if you're able to process and follow three-step commands. So it's just something very quick that we can do to assess uh, mental status. Now, in terms of consciousness, you need to have two neural structures working to be awake. Okay? One is an area we haven't shown you yet, but uh, when we do brainstem sections, we'll see this. Uh, diffuse network, millions of neurons in the brainstem called the reticular activating system. And for now, you can just kind of think of this as like the light switch that turns on the light bulb, which is the brain. And so if you knock out the reticular activating system, um, the patient will be in a coma. Okay, so that always has to be working. And you need to have one cerebral hemisphere intact to be awake. What that means is if a patient has even a large stroke involving one hemisphere, typically those patients are eyes open, awake, they're interactive, if you have a lesion in both hemispheres, now we're going to have a patient who's impaired um, cognitively. Okay, so just for now, two conditions that will affect mental status. Uh, one is dementia. Uh, dementia is a slowly progressive intellectual decline. Uh, this is, we'll discuss next year, now called major neurocognitive disorder, but no one uses that, so dementia is still the primary term that neurologists use. And so, um, as I mentioned, the whole brain's affected, certainly memory, but lots of other 
uh, areas are involved and we get a slow progressive deterioration. Contrast that with encephalopathy. Um, delirium is another term that's used here. I think neurologists prefer the term encephalopathy. So um, this is something that comes on rather abruptly, unlike dementia. Okay, and so this is usually due to some metabolic disturbance and there are literally hundreds and hundreds of causes of encephalopathy. Um, someone who's in intoxicated and confused, well that would be an example of encephalopathy. Uh, maybe someone takes too much of their pain medications, they're overdose a little bit, they're going to be confused. If someone has an infection, they'll be confused. So there's just a few examples, you know, an electrolyte disorder, Someone has diabetes and their sugar is way high or really low. Um, anything like that is a metabolic disturbance and that will cause confusion. All right, so if a patient comes into the emergency room, maybe we don't know the history and you just have before you a confused patient. And so you're trying to sort out, well, is this patient demented? We don't know the story or is this an encephalopathy? Um, if you know the story, that's really helpful. If you know that this 80-year-old individual has been progressively confused for a year, well, that's chronic most likely dementia. If there was an acute change or the patient was normal yesterday and now they're very confused, well, that suggests more of an encephalopathy. <coughs> dementia just tends to get worse. Every few months gets a little bit worse. If you have a patient with encephalopathy, one minute you're in at the bedside, the patient's very confused, and then 30 minutes later you walk in, they're awake and they're talking to you and then they lapse back into a confusion again. So encephalopathies tend to fluctuate quite a bit. Okay, but here I would say is often the most helpful thing at the bedside. Um, if I have someone even with an advanced dementia, their attention's pretty good. They're looking at me, um, they're responding, they're awake. Contrast with encephalopathy, these patients usually are very uh, let's call them sleepy confused. So Mr. Jones is confused and you need to keep tapping him on the shoulder. Wake up, Mr. Jones, wake up. And he answers a few questions and then he falls back asleep again. Okay, that's what I mean by severely impaired attention here. And that would suggest more of an encephalopathy than a dementia. And encephalopathies tend to be reversible. You correct the glucose, you treat the infection, the alcohol wears off, whatever it was, and then the patient gets back to their baseline. Um, dementia syndromes are rarely um, reversible. The patient's going to continue to decline. All right, so um, next we check language and speech. So speech disorders uh, refers to a problem articulating words. And so if we have a problem there, slurred speech, if we want to use correct medical terminology here. This is called dysarthria. Okay, and so dysarthria can be due to lots of neurologic and neurologic problems. Um, and so, for example, any patient that has encephalopathy, again, just think if you've ever seen someone who's intoxicated, they're slurring their words, right? So that encephalopathic, confused patient usually is going to have dysarthria along with it. Um, any abnormality of the vocal apparatus, you know, if a patient has cancer of the tongue or the upper esophagus, it's going to affect their ability to speak. If a patient has maybe a hypoglossal neuropathy and now the tongue is not working well, they're going to slur their words. Okay, so dysarthria can be neurologic or um, non-neurologic. Now, if we use the term aphasia, now we're saying there is a problem with the language pathways in the brain. Wernicke's, Broca's, the connection between Wernicke's and Broca's. All right, so as I mentioned, uh, the language is usually in the left hemisphere. If you're right-handed, it's 95% or greater chance that you're language dominant in the left hemisphere. And if you're left-handed, still roughly 70% chance you're language dominant on the left hemisphere. All right, so we test language function. Um, here are some of the best things we can do. Uh, one is to have a patient repeat sentences. All right, please say today is a sunny day or no ifs, ands, or buts. And these get progressively uh, more difficult. Okay, so if uh, I had a patient the other day pretty, pretty well with repeating complex sentences and then I gave him my hardest one, uh, which is now that cold and icy January is here, 
motorcyclists must beware. And he could not even get started on that one. And I you know, repeated it like three times. So we'll give them more progressively difficult sentences to uh, repeat. And sure, I mean, normal people would often need that. Could you say that again? <laughs> you know, I could repeat it again. So that doesn't mean any of you have an aphasia, okay? <laughs> the other thing we'll do that's really helpful is naming. And you can just point to things. I like to point to knuckles, okay? Because if someone has an aphasia, a word like that you don't use very often, maybe just hard to, to think of. Um, or I'll point to uh, buttons or what part of the watch is this. I might point to my eyebrow or glasses. So we'll have the patient name objects. And then reading and writing is also helpful. And we have some kind of standard script that we'll give patients to see if they're able to read. And then we'll have them write some sentences. All right, so we've talked about, and I just realized I wanted to show a video. So while we talk here, I'm going to get my laptop out because I didn't put this on the desktop. All right, so Broca's area is an expressive aphasia. And so you know that Broca's area is on the uh, inferior, posterior portion of the inferior frontal gyrus. And so if we have an isolated lesion in Broca's area, then patients have a hard time getting words out. Uh, they really have a poverty of speech output, all right? So that when they talk, just very few words um, are getting out. Broca's area is amazing. It, it really perfectly coordinates um, how you talk in, in conjunction with breathing, and also the melody of speech um, is a function of, of speech area. So when we have a Broca's aphasia, you, you lose that melody of speech, intonation, and so you lose uh, prosody with a Broca's aphasia. Okay? Now Broca's area is immediately adjacent to the precentral gyrus. So here's Broca's area. The precentral gyrus is just right back here. So they're both in the same vascular territory, right? It's the middle cerebral artery. So if we have an occlusion of, the, of a more anterior branch of the middle cerebral artery, the patient will have a Broca's aphasia and they're also going to have weakness on the right side of the body. So left hemisphere lesions, you'll get weakness on the right. So we usually see a right hemiplegia um, hemi, of course, means one side of the body. Plegia is weakness. And so we'll see that along with the Broca's um, aphasia. All right. Let me do two things at the same time here. So we also have uh, then a lesion in Wernicke's area. And this is called a receptive aphasia. And, and actually, just right by Broca's area, non-fluent. Okay, very few words out. Wernicke's aphasia is a fluent aphasia because if we have an isolated lesion there and Broca's area is intact, then lots of words are coming out, right? But the patient doesn't understand because you understand with Wernicke's area. So um, this is a fluent aphasia, but the patient is very confused. And when you're, when you're talking with these patients, their answers don't correspond very well to what you're saying. It's like they're kind of two independent things going on. Um, now kind of a, a classic feature of uh, Wernicke's aphasia is that patients make paraphasic errors. Okay, what that means is um, a paraphasic error, these are words that um, don't make sense or it's maybe a correct word but it's used in the wrong context. So for example, the grass is greel. That would be a paraphasic error but the grass is blue would also be a paraphasic error. Yes? Um, paraphasic errors is a bit more specific than word salad. Yeah. Okay, so they look quite a bit different. Um, Wernicke's and Broca's. We use the term global aphasia to describe usually a large middle cerebral artery stroke where we knock out both Wernicke's and Broca's. And these patients are really devastated. They don't understand and they can't get words out. A conduction aphasia describes a lesion of the pathway that connects Wernicke's and Broca's area. Remember the pathway is called the arcuate fasciculus. Okay, so um, if we have a lesion there, just to kind of imagine what would happen if you're in conversation and you have a lesion of arcuate fasciculus? Well, you understand what is being said, 
But then when you want to respond, and responding means moving some information forward to Broca's area, and th then you get the words out. And so if we lose the connection there, uh, that, that makes uh, conversation difficult, and especially out of proportion to everything else, repetition. So you give a patient a, a sentence to repeat. Please say, today is a sunny day. Okay, they understand the command, but they have a hard time moving it forward to Broca's area. Okay, so that's called the conduction aphasia. Okay, and out of proportion to everything else, it's a problem with uh, repetition. Yes? Why can they talk normally? They don't talk perfectly normally. Uh, and so these are difficult. I mean, I, I have to say I've maybe only seen two patients in 20-some years that I thought really had that conduction aphasia. So, but it's such a common board question. And so I'm trying to make it easy for you. It's a problem with repetition. But they do have a little bit of oftentimes a little fluent or non-fluent along with it. But for now, it's just repetition. We'll make it easy. Okay, now the transcortical motor and sensory aphasias are a bit difficult to understand. Um, and basically the areas of the brain around Broca's and Wernicke's area are also involved somewhat in language uh, processing. And so this is usually uh, due to watershed strokes. So just like we were talking about in the spinal cord, there are areas of the brain that have a somewhat vulnerable uh, vascular supply. So if we have a patient who has maybe a cardiac arrest and very low blood pressure for a period of time, they may have strokes in these watershed areas. So one watershed area here is between the anterior and the middle cerebral artery vascular territory. Okay, and so we get a watershed stroke right here. And this is kind of the territory that is around Broca's area. And so these patients kind of look like they have a Broca's aphasia. Okay, they they're not fluent. They don't get words out very well. But the connection between Wernicke's and Broca's is, is intact. This is not arcuate fasciculus lesion. And so they actually do pretty well um, repeating sentences. If we have a, what's called a transcortical sensory aphasia back here, okay, so now this would be between the MCA and the PCA vascular territory. Um, so this is around Wernicke's area. These patients look a lot like they have a Wernicke's aphasia. They're babbling lots of words. They don't understand very much. Um, and, uh, but the connecting pathway between Wernicke's and Broca's is intact. And so they do quite well repeating sentences. Now the question that if you think about it should come to your mind is how can someone repeat sentences if they don't understand what you're saying? Right? Good question. All right, so the, what these patients do is they really often don't understand what you're saying, but when you're just talking with them, they will echo back words that they hear. Okay, so you're, you're interacting with them, you're talking with them, and they will keep repeating some words that you say. And this is called echolalia. They echo back things that you're saying, and that suggests that the, um, the connecting pathway between Wernicke's and Broca's area um, is working fairly well. Okay, so I have a couple of great aphasia videos I want to show you, but uh, I think we'll do this at the beginning of the lecture on Friday, right? So see you then.